first of all, welcome along from, from both of us. I think it's very interesting that you've been on a beautiful evening and uh, in such a delightfully well air conditioned room. Um, I'm sorry about the temperature. I always think when I run in here in the audience that it demonstrates how much heat is generated by the human body. Even the depths of winter in this room is very, um, very hot. I don't think it's generated by the talk over the hot air that we talk sometimes. I'm sorry about the heat. It is I believe that air conditioning is, is on its way, actually, to talk. Um, we're going to talk for about 45, 50 minutes, roughly speaking. Tell me we're going to speak for slightly longer than I am, I think. Um, we're going to take questions at the end. Um, I hope you won't be offended if we refuse to answer a particular question. Because there may be spies in your case. <laughs> and uh, I think it's quite likely that some of you might ask some really bright, fascinating questions about why don't you do this, that, or the other. We were also aware that we just we just got our ethical approval in for this particular piece of research we're going to talk about about functioning imaging of people who have had other amputations. But we know that there are other groups interested in the same field, so we will perhaps have to say, sorry, we can't answer that question because we don't want to pitch the post. Because as the technology develops, as the machinery develops, the scanner is much bigger now. So you can sort of get the person inside the scanner along with some of the experimental devices. So time around with all kinds of interesting ideas about how to the scanners. But we know that we're not the only people in the country or around the world who've got the same sort of ideas. <coughs> we're the best. We're certainly the first. <laughs> we think we're the first. So it's possible we might refuse. The other rule about questions at least is if you could ask the hard ones to Tamar, <laughs> I'll take really easy ones. Okay. The final thing to say in general is we will be looking for controls. Uh, we're going to stop scanning in a few months' time on our subjects, and as we design and um, make more accurate our experiments, we will be looking for controls who eventually will need to be age matched with the population we're researching. But Tamara's asked me to say that there are actually other groups looking for controls for the fMRI scanner, for groups like Parkinson's and various other illnesses, which tend to be predominantly in the second half of life. So um, if you feel you might be too old for our research, the reason I'll tell you about in a few minutes, most of them amputees tend to be younger. But if you're too old for that, they are looking for volunteers to take part in other research. And if you get in touch with Fibber or Sean how to give us the numbers later on. And sometimes you get paid for taking part in these things. Basically you're lying inside the scanner for maybe four minutes to a couple of hours. It's not so intolerable as it used to be, because you can see out through a mirror usually, so it's not like it used to be when you're in a narrow tube. Um, so we need volunteers. So this is a little bit about just about amputations and prostheses in general. Um, here at the Oxford Centre for Enablement, we cover the three counties, Oxford, Berkshire and Buckinghamshire, plus uh, fringes of the counties around. And because people have got the right to choose where they get treated these days, some people choose to come here from a long way away, except for Wales, who were banned from doing this by the Welsh Assembly. We used to have people who came here all the way from North Wales, but they stopped them doing that. So we have people coming from central southern England. And out of that population, we have about 1,800 people who have amputations who come to our centre. The overwhelming majority, roughly 9 out of 10 amputees who come to us, are lower limb amputees. And then we have a small number, roughly approaching 200, around the upper limb amputees. The population is very different. So if you have a lower limb amputation, almost invariably it's due to vascular cause, in other words, blood supply to the legs have become very poor. Most of those patients will either be heavy smokers or diabetics or both, or very old. It's very unusual to lose a leg for vascular reasons if you're very young. So the majority of our patients are either. <coughs> old or smokers or diabetic or even all three of them. So with, with upper limb amputees, arm amputees, the population is very different. Um, we, I'm afraid, have a very regular call about a new motorcyclist who's come off and lost an arm. It's a very common injury for motorcyclists involved in serious accidents. So if they survive, they're often lost an arm. Uh, the second group is tumours. We see a handful each year of new patients who've had a tumour and had to have amputation, that's very sad. And then the third group is congenital population. There are people who are born without a functioning upper limb. Those are fairly small groups, so it's the overwhelming majority is trauma. 
mostly motorcycle, but industrial accidents are quite frequent as well. I saw a man recently who was feeding, um, feeding cuttings, and it, uh, it was a gardening job into one of those machines that breaks it all up, and his arm was just going straight off, straight to the shoulder. And that, that does happen, I'm afraid. Um, so you can imagine this utterly devastating consequence of this patient, a young man, 21 year old, just feeding cuttings, and his glove is gone, but it's snagged on the machine. Pretty horrible. I'm just going to talk for a few minutes about prostheses. For those of you who know any Latin or Greek, I'm not sure which way around it is. There's something Latin, isn't it? One prosthesis is a prosthesis. More than one prosthesis is prostheses. And the people who make these things are called prosthetists. Mm -hmm. um, Tamar is from Israel, and the grammar is slightly different in Israel, and so you'll hear about that. I'll probably use the terminology fractionally different. Um, so this is clearly not an upper limb, but I brought it because I think it's such a beautiful piece of machinery. Um, this is a, a, a prosthetic leg from 1928, so nearly 100 years ago now. And um, this is just a beautiful piece of work, isn't it? I think it's fantastic. So I keep it in my room, I feel get pinched otherwise. Um, and obviously an upper limb amputation, so, sorry, an upper amputation. So, the prosthesis goes right up to here, and essentially you sit on one of these. So your bottom bone, this big bone around here, sits on the back of this, and as you take a step each time, you sit on the prosthesis. Um, what fascinates me about this is what an advanced piece of technology it was for its own day, because these extra wires here would go up to the patient's shoulder, they're not strapped at the moment, but these would have gone over the patient's shoulder, and as this person walked, he would have decided how tight he wanted his knees to be and he would have lifted his shoulder up and down slightly like this. And it's a very advanced piece of technology for those days. And as he tightened it up, the knee would have been tighter. So if he thought he was liable to walk fall, he would have tightened the knee up like this, and then he would have released it doing that. Now, I'm fascinated by that for lots of reasons. One, because I didn't know it. We got all this leg that that was available in those days. But secondly, what made me interest me is what was going on inside his head as he did that? What was his brain having to do as he, as he was walking? moving his shoulder, assessing on the side. Extraordinarily complicated things were going on inside his head as he was using it. And that links up with some of the work we're going to be doing over the next two or three years, Tamara and I, various other people, looking at what goes on inside a person's brain as you use an artificial brain. This is a model of the human brain. For those of you who aren't uh, medically qualified, just to remind you, if I move my right hand, that's actually happening roughly about here on the left side of my brain, predominantly, it happens in other places as well. But most of that movement's happening somewhere over here. My left hand is happening over here, obviously. So um, that is, it's very important when we start to think about the nature of the prostheses that we use. And Tamara and I are particularly interested in what happens to the bits of the brain that would have looked after the hand after an amputation. If you see one of those strange models of the human figure, recreated to look like the representation of the brain, you have absolutely enormous lips, big eyes, a massive hand, very, very tiny representation of your back or the arm around here, and let's call it your homunculus, if you want a name for it, and the homunculus shows us that the representation of the hands around here is absolutely enormous. So amongst the things that we're interested in is to find out what happens to the bits of the brain that represented the hand on the missing side, the hand and the arm, but particularly the hand, after the amputation. I was going to come back to that more in head talk later on. So I just thought I'd show you a few um, contemporary prostheses. 